Aren't you interested in learning breakthrough wealth building strategies, such as how to flip a home in less than two weeks using other people's money with no real estate license, or how to build a low cost home based business? You can discover how to take passive income from any source and invest it into real estate, stocks, or business to become financially independent investing in any market with Residual Roads Business Institute. Collaborate with Andre and other Residual Roads advisors to create a free action plan and start implementing strategies today. Go to www.residualroads.com or email info at residualroads.com. Welcome to the Investing Uncensored podcast. You've been searching for different ways to become financially independent or generate passive income to live out your life's purpose as you've seen others do it, but need insight on how. Well, get excited because here you'll discover the tips and resources to fulfill that need. Andre Stewart has spent more than a decade successfully making it happen for himself and others. This is the Investing Uncensored podcast. And now here's your host, Andre Stewart. Welcome to Investing Uncensored. I'm your host, Andre Stewart. And today I'm happy to bring a great guest. You guys know I love interviewing people in the tech space and especially VC because I have a tech company and I'm in the process of trying to get funded as well. So it's always good to get different perspectives from VCs from different walks of life. And you know, I brought on the old guy from New York. He was a character and then the one from London. So today we got the co-founder of M13. It's a pretty great VC firm based out of Los Angeles. He's also a best-selling author of a book called Shortcut Your Startup. So I'm interested to dive in, in that as well. So Courtney Ream, how are you doing? Great. Great to be here, Andre. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on, man. I've been, you know, like I told you before, I'm excited to have you on because I got a ton of questions for you. And I just want to get, you know, information that can help our listeners out in regards to them starting their startup and trying to get going in their future endeavors. So we talked earlier real quick about you being in some cool places. So give us a little bit about your background. I know you're traveling through the world right now, but give us a little bit about your background, how you got started and um, all that good stuff. Sure. Originally from the Midwest, from Chicago, went to a couple of schools out East, did as you do and you don't know what you're going to do after that. Ended up on Wall Street, uh, actually doing investment banking at Goldman Sachs, which was uh, I think a different experience than it, than it is now, but it was a hard one, but a, but a really good one. Mm. I worked in consumer products investment banking. So I worked on things like help taking Under Armour Public, Vitamin Waters first deal. My big quote unquote resume deal was the merger of Procter & Gamble Gillette. And I think, you know, being around some folks like that, you see a guy like Kevin Plank, the founder of Under Armour, and, you know, is a early 20s wannabe entrepreneur. I was pretty inspired when you see a guy has a lot of moxie, a little grit and, and a good idea and kind of goes with it. So it was a different time, but that was kind of always in the back of my head. Worked for Goldman for a couple of places outside the U.S., and then my younger brother, Carter, who's also now been my business partner for the last 15 years, went to all the same schools, also worked at Goldman. He and I left now almost 15 years ago to be entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. The first company we started was kind of the first better for you, organic, sustainable spirits company called Vive. Mm -hmm. We built from self-distributing on the back of a Prius to selling a million bottles a year and, and exited that about eight years ago. And since then, I've been doing a mix of starting some other companies investing in a bunch. We've been you know, early investors in things like Lyft and Pinterest and uh, Ring, the video doorbell, stuff like that. And then have co-founded a few companies all across consumer tech. So we said, let's put this into a more focused effort and start what is now that effort called M13, which is a consumer technology holding company, which basically means we have venture capital funds. And then we also kind of have what we call our launch pad where we start our own brands and brands with other people. So here we are. That's pretty great, man. I saw your portfolio. You guys have a lot of great companies. I saw Thrive Market, which is, I love Thrive Market. In addition to that, I know the founder of Matterport. That's also a great company because I'm in real estate. So you guys have yeah. been doing some great stuff. How many companies do you guys have? I, could, I, I saw, but it just kept going. So I, I had to yeah. stop. <laughs> the, you thought the scroll button was broken. Um, I don't know if that's good or bad, but yeah, I mean... um. You know, M13 now, in the last five years since we've existed, we've we've now invested in probably 100 and something companies, we'll say. Mm. And then my brother and I personally, prior to that, invested in about the, about the same number. So hopefully we have some learnings and pattern recognition of a, of, a, of a solid, you know, 250, 300 companies at this point. To touch on, I always bring this up too, because the narrative goes around that everyone that maybe runs a DC firm or that has money came from money. And you just mentioned getting your business going out of a Prius. So give us a little bit about that background. And I, you know, I lived in Chicago for about two or three years over 
the military base, Fort Sheridan, Illinois. You know, I stayed there for a while, so I know Chicago is how it is. But give us a little bit about that part. Did you come for money? Were you rich? Or how'd that go? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and we can we can spend the whole hour talking about what I think it means to be self-made because I think that is one of the most o- over grossly misused terms out there because I think almost none of us are self-made in the sense that we had influences, good or bad, and certainly some people have, have risen above theirs more than anything. But I would I would never claim to be self-made because I had incredible examples and incredible parents and mm-hmm. other great mentors. As you said, you know, I'm from Chicago and it was a different time. I was definitely better off than most of my friends, but by no means, um, we were talking Mm -hmm. before this, we're both in LA, definitely not an LA McMansion situation, but (laughs) my parents were incredible in that they they always found a way to make anything happen if they Mm -hmm. thought it would lead to a better life, if they thought it would lead to more opportunity. So I can't say that I didn't have every opportunity and hopefully I took advantage of of that. But my, my parents were both in business, but definitely not entrepreneurship and startups. So that is a skill that I can say my brother and I have really learned from the ground up because no one I know is entrepreneurs growing up, at least in the way we now use it. And uh, as I was getting ready to leave Goldman Sachs and I told someone I thought I was going to be an entrepreneur, they were like, well, what do you mean? I was like, well, I think I'm going to be an entrepreneur. And they said, what, like a, like a snowboard instructor. And I, and this is, you can't even make this up. I was <laughs> like, funny. no, like I'm really going to start something. And they just looked at me kind of puzzled because at that time in, in New York city, you know, everyone was just working for, for investment banks or private equity or hedge funds. So they truly were confused what it meant to to be an entrepreneur. What year was that? Because like you said, people back then, everything was about banking and becoming an investment yeah. banker. Like, you know, Wall Street and all those type of movies. What year was that where you were like, I'm out of here, man? Yeah, like the early aughts, you know, everything from... So I was like, kind of like I'm out of New York about around 2006. Oh yeah, that was early. Decided about a year or two out, about a year after that, we were gonna we were gonna start something. But I, I kind of had this moment where I was sitting there in New York City, and you're kind of in the rat race, working working the hundred hour weeks. But the opportunity was so great, and I got offered a job at a hedge fund, which was all the rage at the time. And when they told me the salary and the the kind of guaranteed money before the bonus, I about fell out of my chair in a in a good way. Mm-hmm. But then I said, "This is it. If I don't if I don't leave now, I'm probably never gonna leave because you're in too deep." And I kind of did a 180. I remember simultaneously a friend of mine was the first one in our group to buy an apartment. And let's say it was like a million dollar apartment. I mm-hmm. walked into that thing and he's like, can you believe it? And I was like, in my head, no, I cannot believe that that's what a million dollars gets you in New York City. <laughs> I need to get out of here. And so uh, I'm glad I did, but each to their own. So then you got out because the devil's when the 08 happened. So you you had to get out right before that or like during that process. when Yeah, I, I basically got out right before it. And then I would get these funny questions because when 08, when, when, that, when the financial crisis hit, that was... August of 08, let's call it, we had just started our spirits brand about six months earlier and it gotten off to a really fast start. And a mm-hmm. bunch of people came to me and said, oh, you saw this coming. And I was like, if I saw it, I remember my dentist literally asked me, he's like, you saw it coming. You're one of those people. I was like, if I saw it coming, you think I would start an alcohol brand? No, I would just like <laughs> short the market and sit in my underwear and rake in the money. I would not start a, a, a physical product in the middle of the biggest crisis even though there was some some merit to saying people drink in good times and bad, but I would have done something very different if I really saw it coming. That is hilarious. You know, and, and it's funny because during that time frame, there's a lot of companies that started that are great. I think Tesla started in that time. A whole bunch of companies started during the, the recession that are killing it right now. So in your company was obviously one of them, right? Yeah. I think people always, you know, recession makes you think differently, makes you think more nimbly. And then I also think, you know, in something like a recession, you're like, hey, I wonder if I should should rent out my place. And the idea originally, you know, Airbnb, as you guys probably know, yep, same thing. for air, bed, bed and breakfast, right? But the idea of like sharing your space or letting someone else stay in your space seemed wild, but it was probably a necessary thing for a lot of people then. And all of a sudden now it's become commonplace. Exactly. And like you said, and during the recession, people have to be creative and try to figure out how to ways to make money. And a lot of times when you're in those situations, you might end, I, like when I was with InvestFar, I needed to come up with another income stream, you know, because we weren't making revenue at that point in time. So then in my desperation, I came up with another revenue stream that has helped us make $2 million in that process. So that's kind of like what happens in a recession. You're like, man, what am I going to do? I need to make money. And then that thing steamrolls into something greater than you, which is good for you on the other side. So with that being said, do you see any parallels between what's going on right now and what was going on in 08 when you were? kind of in the industry. 
Well, there's some parallels and there's things that I'm I'm definitely worried about commercial real estate being a really big one, but that's, you know, that's kind of me doing a, a little soapbox because that's not exactly my area of expertise. But I, I think things are on a lot more stable footing, although there are things like that that worry me. Mm-hmm. If I have to say, I think in the last year, there's been a really nice correction, both on valuations and then also, I mean, again, not to anything that shouldn't be, they're probably now where they should have been. They had just gotten pretty exuberant on, on you know, stuff we see, which is seed and series a mm-hmm. so those have just kind of gone back to a palatable number a fair number not just a wild number and then i think i just see a lot more companies focused on profitability earlier and that doesn't of course have to mean like you're putting money in your pocket but it has to mean that your unit economics profitable or whatever whatever the metric is and mm-hmm. that if you had to kind of start making money there's a path of doing it which is i think just a good fundamental way to do business in general so what do you think about, you just mentioned it a little bit, what do you think about those SPACs at that point in time? Was that 2021 and 2022? What do you guys think about that in that space? Yeah, well, I guess we thought enough of, of it to not put our name with M13 yeah. on a SPAC. Uh, okay, my okay. brother and I, we were curious enough that we got approached by a bunch. So we were advisors to a couple SPACs. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, look, if this happens, I don't want to miss it and i want to i we're a little bit voyeuristic in the sense that we always want to have a ringside seat to these things whether it's just for the learnings but i was like i just don't understand how you could take a company that wasn't doing that well and then have it spack and then have it be traded well and or whatever the case may be and or a company that was worth 100 and then you spack it and all of a sudden it's worth 200 and you know i i think it's a bit of a travesty to be honest because i don't think i don't think there's a lot of, co- I mean, when you start to see the postmortems on this, a lot of companies that shouldn't have SPAC, SPAC yep. a lot of people that shouldn't have invested, lost money. And the people who made money are the people who probably didn't need to make money. It's some some brokers and some bankers and some company executives that I think it was a little bit of a time we'll look back on and say it, it probably shouldn't have been. I was talking to a guy the other day and they're trying to bring it back. I think he just said they, they're coming up with a SPAC. He has apparently did well, whatever company that he had did well. So I think he said they just raised another 300 million for a SPAC. And I'm like, wow. So a lot of some people, like you said, made money and a lot of people didn't. It kind of blew up in a lot of people's faces. But the fact that people are still trying it, I mean, that's that's kind of crazy. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, what SPAC means today, the devil's in the details. I mean, I'd like to hear the difference of that person's definition of SPAC versus IPO versus direct listing. I mean, these things are, if it's such a great company, they can, they, people can IPO their company like they've always done. Exactly. They can do a direct listing. The way some of these SPAC terms have started to move because, you know, it's all negotiation on the those kind of GP, LP economics on it. They've started to sound a lot more to me like IPOs that already have been kind of pre-sold, right. pre-sold to the pre-sold. So yeah, I mean, not that that was not meant to say that none of the SPACs were good, but when People like Chamath, who some people might know from Social Capital, yeah, yeah, yeah. the SPACs A through Z, and now he's trying to sell all the parts for pennies on the dollar. I think that that kind of tells you what you probably need to know as a as a broad statement. I agree with that 100%. And I follow all that, like we talked about earlier. So, you know, to help a couple people out that do have these businesses and that have these startups, what's going on with the, the best-selling book? Give us more information about the shortcut, your startup. Like, I see you do some stuff with YPO, and these are all kind of interconnected. So what kind of information can you give us on that? Yeah, sure. Well, I'd love to talk about YPO, but I'll start with the book first. And then you can tell you about YPO because it's been a big, big part of my life last 15 years. So the book we is called Shortcut Your Startup. It came about because my brother and I were on a, about six years ago, after we had sold kind of our, a couple of our primary day-to-day things, we were on a, we'll call it a, I'll call it nicely a kind of a low budget Shark Tank spinoff show that was on a, a different network station. It was on CBS as opposed to Shark Tank being on ABC. Mm-hmm. I think you should definitely do something for any of your listeners who who know the show or remember it because it won't be many. But, you know, it was broadcast in a couple million homes every week. It was on Saturdays for 30 minutes. It was kind of a family friendly alternative to football. If you were arguing about the remote is what I like to say. <laughs> and out of that, some people were interested in what, what we had to say. And we got approached about a book deal. Ended up doing a deal with Simon & Schuster, who's a, a great publisher, mm-hmm. along with, they call them imprints, but they're basically like subsidiaries that was uh, Derek Jeters, who's someone we knew a little bit socially. And so he was kind of doing books focused on entrepreneurs and athletes, as you can imagine. And so uh, we were his first entrepreneur book. So it was a fun, fun team of people that came together to work on it. We just felt like we were at a point where 
we had seen the way a lot of a lot of these companies were being built, some firsthand, some more passively as investors. And we just wanted to share that knowledge. And so we call them startup switchups, but we have kind of 10 focus areas in there where I would say these were there were things that we were told as kids or that you always thought about business that we call them startup switchups that are now kind of different in the new world order for how you start companies. And so we kind of wanted to share those as well as our you know aggregate learnings from from all the companies we've been involved with. Real quick, so where can, before we hit the hop, hop to the YPO, where can people pick up the book? Yeah, so the book's been out for about five years. So it's it's should be at I hope most bookstores, Barnes and Nobles, certainly on Amazon and, and places like that. We were a, it, was a, it was a bestseller the first first week and first year. But we've actually in years two through five sold about the same number of books month over month, year over year, which feels good because it means I mm-hmm. hope that people like it and are finding value and it kind of has a nice, nice staying power now. We've you know we've sold tens of thousands of copies of the book. So it's been fun to see that out in the wild still. And for people that don't know, selling books is hard. I mean, I have two bestsellers too. And, and it's a it's a different beast to try to get in there because it's not a lot you can do besides marketing. You just hope that the word of mouth spreads. So obviously, like you said, the book is obviously doing well to keep doing the same numbers that it was doing in the first couple of years. So with your with the YPO, I think a lot of people have heard about it, especially if you live in, you know, LA, you kind of know about YPO, but give us a little bit about that and why you decided to been, you know, work with them for so many years. Yeah. So for anyone that doesn't know, YPO stands for Young Presidents Organization, kind of a bit of a funny name, but I think it goes back to the 1950s. I actually believe YPO, Ray Hickok, I think is his name, actually started YPO in LA. So to the best of my knowledge, fun fact, there's more YPO chapters in the greater LA region than any place in the world. But I would call it kind of the the largest kind of CEO or entrepreneur peer-to-peer group in the world. And so there's, you know, chapters in you name it, Dubai and Rome and m- most cities on the map. And so uh, it's a great cross-section of, of founders, CEOs, hired guns. And I've been in it for about 15 years. So they call it your personal board of directors. So I've there's a core group that I've been in what we call the forum with where you, where you meet you know, once a month for a half a day and talk about the top 10% of what's going on in your business, family, and personal, and the, certainly the bottom 10%. And I joined in my late 20s, so it's been very transformational for me. And I met a lot of people I wouldn't have met otherwise, You know, met people that were 10, 15 years my elder. Now there's people that are probably 10, at least 10 years my my junior. Mm-hmm. You know, We live in a world where I think there's always kind of upstream, downstream mentoring. So always have something I can learn from someone and, and hopefully vice versa. So it's been a real transformational thing in my life. I actually just finished being the uh, president of the Bel Air chapter of YPO for the second time, which is pretty unusually, we call it chapter chair, but essentially chapter president a second time. So it was a big, big honor to do that. Do you think, which I, I know the answer to this, but people need to hear it. Do you think being in something like this took you in the direction of wanting to start a, a VC firm or did it help you in any way? Did you raise funds through networking with people in that type of environment or yeah, I mean, I actually think it helped more in terms of like wisdom than than in ways that I could put into like a PL. But certainly, like our first our first fund that we raised went out to a lot of like close friends and YPO type people, and and was lucky enough to have a bunch of those folks back me. But I think more than anything, it's just to kind of have that group of people who knows you really well, where you have total confidence, total trust, and you know, even if you're in some totally different industry than someone. You're like, oh, well, I don't know. They're in a whole different industry. Their equivalent of that is your equivalent of this. And there's usually a lot more you know, common ground and shared experiential wisdom than, than you ever think. So that's where it's really been helpful to me. It's like a sounding board, basically, right? You can mm-hmm. bounce ideas off people. Yeah, it's kind of like a sounding board if they really know you're a little bit of a truth teller. <laughs> You're like, don't do that. That's, that's, that's going to bankrupt your business. <laughs> right. So then everyone wants to always know how to get into a business or start a business and how to raise capital to start their business because it's hard, right? If you don't have an injection of capital, you don't have money, your business is going to fail, especially if you're not making revenue, which is almost impossible the first year or so. You know what I mean? So any advice on how people can raise funds from a, not to the level of what you have with a VC firm, but just in general, because you've obviously had some successful businesses before you became a VC. So how do, how do, what are some advice on people? being able to raise funds from friends, family, or our large networks? Yeah, I think for me, it's always, of course, it is always about raising funds. I think I, I like the, you know, everyone, 
we we talk a lot about in our book, Shortcut Your Startup, about figuring out what your unfair advantages are and exploiting them. Mm-hmm. And I certainly get people coming to me saying, I don't have any unfair advantages. I think that's BS. I think everyone has unfair advantages. And part of this is just understanding who you are and what they are. Now, I don't think everyone's unfair advantages are created equal. Don't get me wrong. That's not what I'm saying. But I think all you can do in the moment is figure out your best unfair advantages and start to harness them. And so if you're a first time founder and have no clue where to get money, I get that that's not easy. And I don't have an easy answer for you, except for to say that, you know, there's a lot of money out there. It's just it's just a matter of usually one or two people saying yes. And I think for me, tenacity and grit still go a long way. And I think that's I see that lost on a lot of newly minted early and mid 20s entrepreneurs. So sometimes just someone following up and following through and figuring out a way to do it pleasantly, persistently, as I like to say, goes a long way. But, you know, we have access to a lot of these things, right? So it used to be you'd never be able to get Tim Cook's email. You can get Tim Cook's, Tim Cook, I know you're not going to get money from Tim Cook, but you can get (laughs) Tim Cook's email. I know Tim Cook's email. Getting Tim Cook to answer might be a lot harder. I've only emailed him three times myself, but still nothing. But you'd be surprised, like stories of Jeff Bezos responding to someone or this or that, because everyone's kind of accessible, but it just matters if you pick the right day and strike the right chord and hit them at the right time. And so I always encourage people to be really thoughtful about that because, you know, I I remember there was a guy who told me a story. This is kind of pre-email days when he was trying to get someone's attention. He would just start sending him FedEx packages because back in the day, chances are uh, fewer people had their assistants open their FedEx packages for who knows what reason. So if you sent a FedEx, there was a good chance that the the, the boss or the end user you want is going to get that. And he would just start sending one a week, one a week, one a week. And then finally, the guy's like, okay, I got the point. You sent 20. He's like, I can keep going. I'm just getting warmed up. But you got to find like, you know, whatever's true to you with that and then really work on it. But I, I think it's that combined with, you know, the market's gotten smarter. So getting funded just because you're charming is probably not going to happen anymore. So it's about kind of having this little MVP where you have like a minimum viable product where you start to show a little little more than a cocktail napkin in a dream with some persistence. Ever wished you had the opportunity to buy a stock like Facebook, Amazon, or Netflix before it went public or was able to get shares in companies like VC firms and angel investors? Well, here's your chance. Go to investfar.com forward slash invest and reserve a position. For the next one to three months, InvestFAR is allowed a limited number of low-cost shares be available for friends, family, and its community per SEC regulations before it goes public. Imagine being able to 1,000x or 10,000x your investment, like the top 5%. With exclusive opportunities such as this, positions are limited and the window of time is short. Don't miss your chance. That's I-N-V, as in Victor, E-S-T-F-A-R dot com forward slash invest. I talk about that quite a bit on the on the podcast. I'm always like, you know what? Technology has bridged the gap, right? I think before there was an issue, but I don't I I have an issue with technology, which most people do because of what it's done with society. But as a whole, there has never been a time where you can just reach out to your mentor whenever you want to because of Instagram or Twitter. So if you can send a compelling enough message, like you said, whether it be via email, Instagram, Twitter, that person will respond to you, right? It just has to be compelling enough for it to make sense. And then be like, you know what? Let me let me look into this more. So you are definitely correct on the, even I think Mark Cuban has said the cold email. People still answer cold emails. You know what I mean? That's that's something that people still do. Yeah, yeah, it's a cold email, but it matters. You put in the subject line. It matters how long it is. It, the one that people don't ever think about. It matters what time of day you send it. I I can't give you like a one size fits all, but like less likely I'm going to be able to like key to the middle of the day or first thing in the morning because I'm on West Coast time versus end of the day or whatever else. I don't mind getting emails on weekend because chances are it'll get seen. There's a lot when it hits your inbox and what state you're in, right? Correct. 100%. So then, you know, we're talking about that, about raising funds and, and getting funding. One thing that we talked about back in 2001, 2002, and this is, a, this is what I hear a lot too. Yeah. I think we're not back in 2001, 2002. There is exuberance, and there's some categories that are that are you know raising its valuations. AI, obviously, for mine, and there's been 
things like software, but I think there's a lot of reasons it's not 2001, 2000 World Wide Web. So I think this, there are pockets that are overheated. But you know what? There's there's other now versus e that are that are trading at too low in my opinion. So I think it's a lot less uh, across the board now than it was 102. So I, I think it's a pretty different time personally. And no, I 100 agree. So I always ask the VCs that have came on this same question. Obviously, I'm a minority founder. And so there's a common thing going around with underrepresented founders being able to receive funding from VCs. And I think in 2021, I think 30 billion. In 2022, 216 billion went out. And only 1% of minority founders were able to get funding from that. You have any feedback or any kind of light you can shed on, you know, the underrepresentation and why that may be the case with, with minority founders or underrepresented people of color? Yeah, I guess first I'd just say I, I I'll raise my like I do better. A bunch of us need to do better. That is not okay. Um, but I think yeah, listen, we we need to do more. We need to look places and but it is also a two way street, right? I, I want it is it is harder to are going cold and don't have a network. Some people manage to do it still, and so um, yes, I guess for us. I want to democratize good founders and founders. I think I just want to find founders and look in unconventional places. That's that's what we try and do. Other areas, other people with different focuses. But yeah, I think it's really important that for the next great idea, I want to do, you know, Steve Case, who who we like actually was one of the the what's on the back of our book from Revolution uh for of AOL, you know, his theory of the democratization of startups and good founders, the rise of the rep, um, you know, underrepresented, certainly in race and ethnicity, but I want underrepresented parts of this country that don't traditionally get in because they're, they're all. So I guess all I, I realize we have to do our part and, uh, that it's largely incumbent on us, but please hear that, that I know of M13, we're out there looking. So try, try to get in our harm's way we can we can uh intersect and meet <laughs> you know it's funny because you're correct one thing that i know because i i've had my company for a while and so i put out a job board for to get certain employees right i put it and there's like there's not there's like that's not a lot of minorities in tech but i put out a couple of different uh applications for people to you know come work for the company but out of that i think we have 500 people that apply for the job out of that 500, only five people out of the entire 500 were minorities. So it's like, again, I hear where you're coming from, but and even from this standpoint of me, I, don't, I just ask that question because I always ask it, but I know what's going on because I'm in it myself. And I see that there, there's not a lot of minorities that are trying to apply and be into the, to the, to the tech space. So it's kind of hard, in my opinion, to get funded or to get, uh, you know what I mean? The, because the pool is so small. You can't be like, because I'm a minority, you need to give me money. You need to fund my business because it's a small percentage of us. I'm the same way the way I run my, the way I run my business. I'm not looking at color. I'm looking at how they can help the bottom line. So I, don't, I shouldn't have to, or people shouldn't have to do something based on someone's nationality. Would it help if they had the skill set to do it? Yes, it would. But you shouldn't be put in that box. But I know that's the question that people always ask. So I always have to ask. But I know from my standpoint, there's not a lot of, minorities that are applying themselves in that space to be able to get the funding. You know what I mean? And, and so the, I think the kind of companies that tech companies look for, a lot of minorities are particularly starting those type of businesses, in my opinion. You know what I mean? You guys might be looking for, depending on the company that you're looking for, it just might not be a good fit. But you guys aren't trying to fund a barbershop or a restaurant because the exponential growth is probably not there. You know what I mean? So I think it all depends. And we, you know, we're, 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 we're in well, make money by doing good. So the last thing I was to one because I, you know, I, I just want to best, best people. I make sure I'm seeing a, uh, you know, myopic view of that as broad a uh, swath as possible of, of people and and genders and and geographic diversity. So yeah, it's and them because listen, the more we fund minority, the more those companies do well, the better it will be. We can't fund more and then not have them. We have to, everyone has to kind of hold up the bargain. Exactly. Exactly. 
So I know, uh, like I said earlier to you, I'm in the process of raising funds myself. But I'm just curious to know, what is M13's typical investment range? What kind of companies do you guys look for? And what is your expectation of founders that come to you guys? Yeah. Um, so we don't really do kind of pre stuff and even seed stuff. Um, you know, we want to see some revenue and some traction. We're initially Series A invest, um, A as an Apple, which kind of means there's some product fit or some revenue or do all we do all technology. Um, our focus on uh, the future consumer behavior, we call it, then that we kind of have sub four verticals. Uh, the future of commerce, future of health, the future and the future of work, which um, we think largely kind of encompasses where the future of consumer behavior will go. So those are our focus areas. Um, I'd say we write checks, you know, kind of as as low as a, a couple million to get a wedge in the door. But our core checks, um, you know, are ideally something uh, in the high single digits, probably up to 10, 10 million. So we want to be traditional Series A investors, but occasionally we we come in earlier to um demonstrate our value or we see a, something we just love and we don't we don't want to wait. Okay. So majority of the companies that you guys have on the portfolio, you hopped in in seed or series A? I would say we definitely series A is our sweet spot. We only do seed almost as a means to series A. We never do a seed check thinking that's the last check we'll write. We do a seed check with the belief that we're going to put more in or add more value and and capital in the series A. And so with, with people that are maybe at that level, how does someone get in touch with you or you got you guys to have their deal checked out? Yeah, well, you can a bunch of different ways. My email, I'll just share it because it's pretty easy to find in peers, but it's just my first name, Courtney at m13.co. And then, you know, there's there's links on our website where you can just reach out. But I I promise you, I or someone who works for me checks every single email. So um, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that we try to get back to almost everyone yeah always never know where that next idea is coming from so always when someone says to me do you want to see a, a, a deal in my head of course you're thinking sometimes like oh, i don't know if i need to see another deal i've seen i've seen dozens a week hundreds i personally see you know thousands a year but mm-hmm. you never know where it's coming from so i never want to say no to a potential lead for people that can't raise through vcs there's different platforms out there like Seed Invest or WeFunder. What do you think about those kind of platforms? I think those are are good to raise some of the first money. Mm. Huge amounts there, but I think it's good because it's it's a two for one, right? You're getting some money, but really what you're getting is kind of a built in set of evangelists. With most, I, I would say, in my experience with those, a lot of the products are kind of consumer facing products. Mm-hmm. So what you're hopefully getting is someone who is a natural evangelist or a forced evangelist because they've invested in your brand. And then <laughs> yeah. the whole key is like, they're probably more likely to have a conversation with you about your product. They're more likely to give you honest feedback, all that stuff. But that's the real gift in that feedback. So I would not lose sight of the fact that, yes, you need the money to run your company, you know, as we call it in our in our book, the gasoline to fuel the speedboat, but really take advantage of those those people being more willing to try your product, tell other people, be loyalists, be evangelists. I agree with that. And I also think, you know, I got like one or two more questions for you, but I also think that because there's so much money floating around and I think what happened in 2020 with all that money floating around through whatever the government did, I think there might be like a misconception of like, how about you start a business and you, you know, do what you got to do and bootstrap it until you get to the point of where you have a lot of money coming in. So you don't necessarily need the money, but you would like the money because it'll blow your business up that much faster. So mm-hmm. I think the lost art of building a business to make money and then for it to sustain itself is kind of gone. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I mean, let's not forget before the internet, before a lot of businesses were built pre-2000, how were they all built? They were all just built word of mouth and everything else. And so it's a really good test if people like your product and are sharing it and talking about it and there's some stickiness. And that's how all of our forefathers and grandfathers and grandmothers built their businesses. So it's it's possible. And and just to piggyback off that, when I, I I think in the beginning, I think 2019, I pitched two VC. They were interested, and this my, I have a and you can invest remotely globally with my platform with real estate. So it's a global platform you can invest remotely anywhere with anything. So I went and approached a couple of VCs, and they just thought I was too early. So and I only did it once, and I was like, you know what? It's okay. I'm gonna just grassroots this because I had a misconception of like nobody wants to invest in my company because I'm black. Which it wasn't the case, right? I was just early 
And my product really wasn't where it should have been. So I went in, bootstrapped it, and, and within the past year and a half, we got our revenue to two million. And so I, I haven't raised any outside funds. I did all of this by myself. Like I told you earlier, I created the a different division in the company that started generating revenue. So it's possible to go out there and build a company and do what I just said. And so now at this point, I'm trying to explode the business further. Now I'm going to go raise capital. But if it didn't work out, I would still do the same thing I'm doing now. It's just a slower process. And I think people that do what I'm doing have more skin in the game. So they're more willing to see it go through versus somebody that gets $100 million. Like we worked. I don't know how much money we were got, but they just destroyed that, that company, you know? Yeah. So if you get too much money too fast, this could be yeah. a, like a, you know. The most popular chapter in our book is called Know Whether You're a Sailboat or Speedboat. It sounds like you've been a, a, a very successful sailboat. And we work was clearly a speedboat. Speedboat is <laughs> powered by gas. That gas was venture capital dollars. You've kind of had the way a sailboat works is you catch a gust of wind, make some Boom. progress, yep. move along the path. The wind dies down. Maybe you're sitting there a little. And, you know, progress is consistent, but kind of lumpy. And maybe at some point it's not as fast as you'd like, but it is gradual but continual progress. Whereas we work with just uh, 80 mile an hour speedboat, but they're going to, it appears, be stuck out in the middle of the ocean, right? <laughs> and then the thing about it too, the, the amount of information you learn on that process when you have to figure out how to generate revenue, you learn how to manage money. So if you do get a round of 20 or 30 million, you're going to do a way better job than a company like WeWork that got 100 million thrown at them within the first, I don't know, 15 or 18 months. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Any kind of advice you can give to anyone looking to start a business and trying to get funding? I would just say, you know, realize that all it takes is this is this is like being a, a an actor in Hollywood. I mean, it's all it takes is your one big break. You know, you said you went out to one of them could have, but the odds were overwhelmingly. No matter how good you company your idea is, overwhelmingly against you because you went out to. I mean, we say no to ninety something percent of companies we see. We do see a lot of good ones, so it's just a bit of a game. But there are also billions and billions and billions out there. But there are also Literally, I think probably closer to tens of VCs out there. I don't claim it's easy. But I claim that it's a numbers game. If you go out to, if you have 30 meetings, everyone says no, yeah, they've made mistakes, but I think probably take a look at your proposition or at least how you're presenting it. Mm -hmm. Go out to two, that's just not big enough sample size. You know, you, you got to go out to more people and have more conversations. And I think sometimes even just position like, hey, I would love your feedback on this. I'm not a server for money. It's the old ask for money and get advice, for advice and get money. I think that really does work because everyone likes to feel like they're dispensing wisdom. And so I've done that one and I've had that, that one done on me. <laughs> that's funny because you're right. I mean, that's like an easy in. You're not, you're not like, how can you turn someone down asking for help? <laughs> right. And with a little, little buttering up, like I so respect your work in this, you've made investments in this. You're so smart. I'm just starting out. Could I just buy you one cup of coffee? And, and and like you said, most of the time when people raise funds, I know a lot of people that have just because of the, the podcast, they go through 50 to 75 VCs over like the course of like one or two months. It's a long process. And I don't think people get that. They just see the people that got the money, but they don't know how long it took. They don't know if they sat down through 100 people and the five said, you know what I mean? Or two or one said yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think it's still harder to run for uh, a senator, much less a president. But other than that, it's it's a grind. Anyone who's done it kind of appreciates the hustle to it for sure. Well, I'm gonna see my deal, like you just said. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna send it to you just to get some feedback, just because I'm curious. You've done it before. You've invested in real estate companies, so it'd be good to hear what you have to say about mine. So I'm gonna use your trick on you that you just told me. If that's fine, <laughs> <laughs> it would be a pleasure. Please send it over. <laughs> Okay, man. I, I appreciate you for coming on. I know you're in Albania. He's over there hanging out, man. He's 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 living life, guys. You know, I know you're in Albania having a good time. You know, you're gonna be there for another couple of days. Do you have uh, any books that you can share with somebody besides yours, or anything that you want to leave somebody with, or leave the listeners with? I do like Ben Horowitz's book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things, because I think mm -hmm. like more people need to just talk about like. I, I'm going to be honest, I have not read all of his book. I've glanced at it, but just the title tells you what you need to know. I think more people just need to be realistic about the the unglamorous side and how hard it is. Yeah. Only because 
you'll have less feelings of aloneness, less feelings of, oh, my business stinks or imposter syndrome or whatever it is. So I think it's important to just understand. I can tell you from where I sit, some of the most successful companies I've been a part of at one point, I thought I had no chance. And some of the ones I was sure where there were going to be huge home runs. And I'm like, the only question is, am I going to make five times my money, 10 times my money, hundred times my money? I lose all my money. It's, it's just <laughs> how it goes. And there's, there's still, there's, there's still a rhyme and reason to it. And there's still also a lot of kind of kismet and serendipity. So you got to kind of hang in the pocket and stick with the game. I agree with that hundred percent. I mean, last thing I'll say, and then we're going to go, he's right. There's a huge misconception about being an entrepreneur. It's trending, right? It's trending to be an entrepreneur, trending to be a real estate investor. Those are the things that are trending, but no one knows how hard it is, how taxing it, how taxing it is on your mental, your family, your friends, because you disappear, you're a ghost. So I, like you said, I think people need to understand what they're getting into before they get into it and then make that decision. Amen. Courtney, thank you for coming on. Got to bring you back. I do something called Investing Uncensored Roundtable where we bring a couple of different investors and people from different walks of life together and do a roundtable. So I would love to have you on that. You know, once you get back, I'm going to let you hang out, enjoy your time over there. Once Sounds you get back, great. hopefully we can catch up. Look forward to it. Thanks, Andre. Take care. Thanks, Courtney. Aren't you ready to start a business or grow your real estate investing portfolio? If you answered yes, allow Andre and the expert advisors at the Residual Roads Business Institute to fast track and put you on a path to full-time investing. The greatest transfer of wealth in our lifetime is occurring over the next few years, and you can take advantage if you know what to look for. In order to be successful at real estate investing, you need to learn how to leverage your current resources to generate quick money, big money, and retirement money. Let Residual Roads advisors craft a plan to get you through these phases using little or no money in six months or less. Don't wait for a job. Create one for yourself and others. Go to residualroads.com for mentorship and for our free course, go to residualroads.thinkific.com.